Okay, thank you very much for this uh, invitation to speak in this uh, wonderful seminar. Um, I'm going to discuss a recent joint work with uh, Colin Favergeon, who is working with me in Lyon. And uh, the talk will be divided into uh, two parts. So in the first part, I'm going to discuss Mahler's method, which is a part of transcendental number theory. And I want to present some recent results in, uh, in that theory. And then in the second part of the talk, I will um, explain how to use this uh, new results uh, to solve problems that are related to the Furstenberg conjecture from the paper and that involve a finite automata. So let's start with um, um, transcendental number theory and Mahler's method. So uh, much of transcendental number theory is concerned with uh, uh, the values of a complex analytic function with algebraic coefficients at algebraic points. So uh, the situation, for instance, that you have a several function f1 of z, fn of z, uh, which are complex analytic function with algebraic coefficients and uh, let alpha be an algebraic point. And of course, um, if there is a, an algebraic or say a linear relation over the field of rational function between this function f1, fn, uh, you can specialize this relation at the point alpha, of course, assuming that the function f1, fn are well defined at alpha, to get a similar relation over the field of algebraic numbers uh, between the values of the complex numbers f1 of alpha, fn of alpha. And the transcendental number theory uh, try to go the other way. So, for instance, if you are able to prove that the function uh, exponential of alpha one z up to exponential of alpha and z are algebraically independent, then you can deduce that the numbers, yeah, e of alpha one, up e of alpha n are algebraically independent if alpha one and alpha n are algebraic numbers. So this is a typical example of a situation where you go the other way. Uh, but it's also known for a while, so more than a uh, hundred years ago that the you cannot, this cannot be true in general. So for instance, you can construct uh, a transcendental function that is uh, an entire function with algebraic coefficients, but that take algebraic values at all algebraic points on the complex plane, okay? But still, uh, there are a few non-frameworks where the converse assumption is essentially true. Uh, but in that case, uh, you have to put some more structure on the function f1, fn, and usually, usually they have to be related uh, by some kind of uh, system of functional equations. And typically, uh, they can be related by some linear differential equations or by linear difference equations. Um, uh, probably the main known example of such framework is the theory of Ziegel E function that was developed by Ziegel and uh, Shidlovsky mainly, uh, and that is related with the entire function like the exponential function um, that are related by some system of linear differential equation with polynomial coefficients. And Mahler's method uh, that was initiated exactly at the same time Siegel introduced the E functions uh, provide another such framework. Uh, and this is the framework I'm going to discuss now. Uh, so, I will introduce the M functions in analogy to the E function. So M stands for Mahler. And uh, the very basic example is given by the sum of the Z to the two to the M. So it's easy to see that this function F of Z satisfies the inhomogeneous relation. F of Z square is just F of Z minus Z. So when you look at F of Z square, it's just a shift of the series and you get this relation. And uh, Mahler used in a clever but elementary way uh, this equation to prove that the values of this function uh, are transcendental for all algebraic, non-zero algebraic number in the open unit list. Uh, this equation, so it's inhomogeneous because we have this uh, minus z here, but uh, of course you can turn it into a homogeneous relation of order two instead of an inhomogeneous relation of order one, and you get this following equation that involves f of z, f of z square, and f of z four. And this motivates the following definition. Um, we fix q, a natural number, at least equal to two, 
And we say that a power series with algebraic coefficients is a cumulative function or an MQ function. If you can find uh, polynomials with algebraic coefficient P0, Pn of Z, uh, which are not all zero and such that uh, F of Z satisfy the following linear difference equation. So in the setting of E function, for instance, we study similar equations, but uh, with a uh, derivative of the function f, the successive derivative of the function f, and here the derivative are replaced by uh, the action of the uh, morphism, um, the operator z give to the q. So we use the power of q iterated uh, m times. And we will just say that uh, f is an m function if it is an mq function uh, for some q, and we do not uh, want to say more about this particular q. Um, in this definition, it's very important that we are considering solution to this equation that are power series. Uh, for instance, uh, the logarithm satisfy, of course, log of zq is q log z, so it satisfies such equation, uh, but it's not an m function, and the theory, unfortunately, does not apply to, to this uh, logarithm because it's not analytic around zero. So what happens with m function? So they are defined as power series, but in fact, uh, such power series are always convergent. So they are analytic in some neighborhood of zero. Uh, and uh, we can prove using the equation that uh, an M function is always can be uh, continued meromorphically in the open unit disk. And then you have the following nice uh, dichotomy. So either the function is a rational function, in which case it can be continued meromorphically in the wall open complex plane. Or if not, uh, the power series and M function is transcendental. It has the unit circle as a natural boundary. So you, you and it is meromorphic into open unit disk, but cannot be continued outside this open unit disk. So in particular, it doesn't satisfy any linear differential equation because it has infinitely many singularities. And recently, in a joint work with Charlotte Ardouin and Thomas Dreyfus, we even proved that an M function, when it's not rational, uh, does not satisfy any algebraic differential equation. So it's called hyper transcendental. And this is much harder to prove. And for this, we use some Galois series attached to this equation. But let's come back to transcendental number theory. So the very first question we can imagine about this M function is a fundamental, uh, following fundamental question. So if you choose one, uh, M function transcendental and alpha an algebraic point where f is well defined. Can we decide whether f of alpha is transcendental or not? So it's a simple question, but um, not that easy. Uh, essentially, Mahler's uh, already answers the question is the case of order one equation, inhomogeneous order one equation, but we would like to have an answer for general equations. Um, so as usual, and this is the case also with uh, with linear difference equation. So we can move from equations to a linear system. So if you have an equation of order one, you can move to a system of size of size uh, an equation of order m. You can move to a system of size m using the so-called companion matrix. And uh, for instance, if you have this uh, equation of order two, we already saw. Uh, you can turn into a two by two linear system where now um, we have some uh, coordinate fz, f of z square, and the matrix of the, this um, uh, system is a two by two matrix whose uh, coefficients are rational function uh, with uh, algebraic coefficient. And this is a general fact. So uh, what we want to study are such system, uh, such matter system. So um, we consider uh, so a Q manner system is a system of the form YZ is AZ Y to ZQ, where AZ is just a matrix, uh, M by M matrix that is invertible and the coefficients are rational function with algebraic coefficients. And once we have a system like this, we have, what we want to consider is a vector solution, um, F1 of Z, FM of Z, uh, whose coordinates are Q matter functions, so MQ functions, so they are power series solution to this system. Okay, so what can matter method can do for us? Uh, the first thing is that we have to uh, define some bad points. And by this, 
I mean the singular point with respect to the systems. And they are exactly the points that can be mapped under the operator Z give to ZQ to some pole of the coefficient of the matrix AZ or some pole of the coefficient of the matrix AZ minus one. So that is a point that can be sent by the operator to some place where the matrix is not defined or the matrix is not invertible. But once you remove these bad points, you have the following uh, very nice results that was obtained by uh, Nishoka in 1990. And uh, that is arguably uh, a major theorem in this theory. It says the following thing. Uh, you pick an algebraic number alpha in the open unit disk that is non-zero. And uh, you assume that it's a regular point. And so under this general assumption, uh, you get that the transcendence degree uh, of the function f1, fm, f1 of z, fm of z, so the vector of solution to your systems over the field of rational function is the same as the transcendence degree of the values um, f1 of alpha, fm of alpha over the field of algebraic numbers. Okay, so in particular, if you are able to prove that the function f1, fm are algebraically independent, then you get that the values are algebraically independent. In that case, each value is transcendental in particular. So this would solve the, the, the first problem in that case. But unfortunately, this is not always the case that the, the vector solution have algebraically independent coordinates. So in general, this is not the case. And you, you have to, to, to compute exactly this transcendence degree. Um, an important thing to note here is that uh, it's very important to focus on regular points. So I'm going to show you the following example. So if you consider this infinite product, the function g of z, that is defined as a product over n of the one minus two uh, z three to the n. So it's a transcendental function that is an n three function. It satisfies a very simple equation of order one. So uh, you can see this as a one by one system. So the matrix is just as just one coefficient with, with, that is one minus two z three. And uh, so the transcendence degree for the system, the transcendence degree of the function, you only have one function. So the transcendence degree is one because the function is transcendental. But now you see that if you evaluate the function at point alpha such that alpha three to the n is one half for some n. So there is one term in the in the infinite product that vanishes. So the, the, the whole product will vanish. Uh, and in that case, the transcendence degree of the value is zero. So you see that the theorem is for, the conclusion of the theorem does not hold because the transcendence degree on the right is one and the transcendence degree on the left is, is zero. Um, and the point is that these particular points are exactly uh, the singular point for the system, okay? So the singular point are already the point where uh, the theorem is not. Okay, so Nishoka theorem is a really nice theorem. It's the exact analog of the ziegel chidlowski theorem for E function, right? It plays exactly the same role. Um, but this result is a quantitative statement. So it can be rephrased as an equality of dimension, of cruel dimension between uh, some rings. So it just says that there are no more algebraic relations between the functions and between the values. And uh, this is a, a kind of deficiency because uh, the typical situation is that we have one M function we are interested in. And so we put it into a system and then we have other function. We don't know too much about them. So in this situation, the only thing we can know if the function is transcendental is that the transcendence degree on the right is at least one because we start with one transcendental function. So the conclusion is that the transcendence degree on the left is at least one, uh, saying that one of the number here uh, is transcendental, at least one of these number is transcendental, but we do not know which one. So you cannot say that you only use the values F1 of alpha is transcendental. Okay, and recently uh, this quantitative statement has been refined by uh, Philippon as a qualitative statement. So the qualitative statement is the following one. So imagine that the, under the same uh, assumptions and Nishoka theorem, so we start with a system, a vector of solution and a regular point. So alpha is assumed to be a regular point in this theorem. 
So imagine you have an homogeneous relation between the values f1 of alpha, fm of alpha. Then this relation can be lifted as a relation between the function f1 of z, fm of z, so that if you specialize, specialize at alpha, you get the original relation. So this theorem really takes care of any relation between the values. Um, and this is clearly uh, the, the situation we, we, the best situation we can hope, as I explained at the very beginning of the talk. Um, here I put the homogeneous part in red because uh, it's a stronger result than the, than the result without this uh, homogeneous part. Because for instance, it says that if the functions are linearly independent, then the values are linearly independent because uh, an homogeneous relation has to be lifted in an homogeneous relation of the same degree. Um, and uh, Philippon proved uh, these results without this uh, homogeneous part. And uh, the, 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 this complement has been given uh, in my joint work with, uh, with Colin Favergeon. Um, so I would like to mention here that again, uh, Nishoka's theorem was the analog of the ziegel chidovsky theorem. And here, similar results were first proved in the realm of E functions. So by Shidlovsky and then Nesterenko and Shidlovsky. And the precisely the, the exactly same results in the context of E function was first proved by Fritz Bakers um, using some results of André. And then it, was, it has been reproved by André using some uh, new kind of Galois theory. Um, and in all these cases, these cases, uh, the lifting theorem are deduced from Nishoka theorem. Okay, so you start with Nishoka theorem and prove that if Nishoka theorem is true, then you can prove this lifting theorem. And uh, more recently, uh, uh, Galoisian proof in the same spirit as Andre uh, was provided by Nagi and Zamueli in the context of M function. So going from Nishoka to Philippon theorem. Um, once you have this uh, lifting theorem, uh, you can in fact solve the, the, the very first question. So this is what we did with uh, Colin Favergeon. So we prove the following results. So you start with uh, f of z and m function and alpha and algebraic point, and you just assume that f is well defined at alpha. So here the main feature is that uh, your m function is arbitrary. And the point is also arbitrary. So we do not uh, say that alpha has to be regular, a regular point with respect to some hidden system. So just the function is well defined at alpha. And we consider the number of it generated by the coefficient of f and alpha. So uh, this is, I have to, to say that uh, when you have an m function, so because of the equation, so the coefficient always generate a finite extension of q. So, the, the, the field generated by the coefficient and alpha is always a number field. And then the conclusion is that we have the following dichotomy. So either the values f of alpha belong to this number field k, or f of alpha is transcendental. Okay, so the function is arbitrary, the point is arbitrary, but the price to pay is that we have a dichotomy. We cannot prove that f of alpha is transcendental, and this is not true in general. I already show you one example where the function vanishes. Um, but uh, we have this dichotomy. And uh, already in the case uh, k equal q, so when the coefficient of the power series are rational numbers and uh, alpha is a rational number, so this, this uh, result was conjectured by Cobham in 1968. And uh, in that case, it, the conclusion is that f of alpha is either rational or transcendental. And in many cases, you are able to prove that it's not rational, so you deduce that it is transcendental. And uh, more than this, uh, the proof uh, is effective, so it provides an algorithm to decide uh, this alternative. So by this, I mean, if you give me an M function, so the way you give me an M function is you, you give to me uh, an equation, a Mahler equation uh, with sufficiently many initial coefficient of the power series so that it is uniquely defined and a point alpha. And if you give me this finite amount of data, uh, the algorithm will say whether f of alpha is transcendental. And if not, it will compute the value of f of alpha. Okay, so with this, we can say that the, the, the first fundamental question is completely solved. So we know really well how to manage the transcendence of the value of one matter function at some algebraic point. 
But the result I would like to focus on today is a, of a different nature. So the framework is uh, as follow. So what we do is uh, we choose uh, several uh, Mahler functions, so say F1, FR, uh, and they can be associated with some uh, operator QI that may be different. And then we, we choose a bunch of points, alpha one, uh, alpha R, uh, which are um, algebraic points, which are non-zero in the open unit disk. And we just ask that the functions are well-defined at this point. And again, we consider the field that is generated uh, by all the coefficients of all these functions and all the points alpha i. So uh, again, I say just k is just a number field. So this is our new framework. So we have several functions and several points. Uh, I recall that uh, some complex numbers, alpha one, alpha r, are said to be multiplicatively independent uh, if there is no non-zero tuple of integers and one and r, so that the product alpha one and one up to alpha r and r is equal to one. So if you choose two, three, and five, they are multiplicatively independent, but the number two, five, and 10 are not, okay? And with this definition, I, I can state our main results. So uh, in fact, there are two uh, theorems in one, so we assume we are in this, uh, this framework with the function fi and the point alpha i, and uh, we assume over uh, one of these two situations. So the first situation is when the, the point alpha i are multiplicatively independent. And the second situation is when the, the parameters qi associated with the, with the Mahler operators are pairwise multiplicatively independent. And in each situation, the conclusion is that uh, the number f1 of alpha 1, f2 of alpha 2 up to fr of alpha r are algebraically independent over the field of algebraic numbers, unless one of them belong, at least one of them belong to the number field k. Okay? So the first comment here is that um, in the case a equal 1, so if you are, only have one function, so the, the condition i and 2 are both trivial. So, and you, what you obtain is exactly the previous theorem. So the dichotomy, either f of alpha is belong to k or f of alpha is transcendent of. So case, the case L equal one is a previous result. Uh, again, uh, the main feature here and the main uh, difficulty to prove this result come from the fact that the, the fi is satisfy arbitrary uh, Mahler equations. You don't know, uh, there are not order one equation also solution of order one equation, but they satisfy arbitrary order equations. Uh, the points are arbitrary. Uh, the QI here are essentially arbitrary, so you can have several kinds of transformation. And uh, a remarkable feature here also is that uh, if you think a bit about Nishoka theorem or Philippon, the, the lifting theorem by Philippon, so those results say that um, if the function are algebraically independent, for instance, then the values are. So you have to, to check uh, that some function are independent in some sense. And here, uh, there is nothing to do like that. So you get for free directly the algebraic independence of the values, okay? Um, the point is that uh, the theory I described before, uh, the Nishoka theorem or uh, Philippon lifting theorem, um, do not apply at all when you, you want to prove this theorem. So, and um, instead, so in, you have to um, develop similar results, but in a more general framework. Uh, I just would like to give a few words on, uh, on this framework. So the point is that instead of uh, staying with a um, function of one variables, what we have to do to prove this theorem so is to develop uh, a general theory. So the result like Nishoka theorem of uh, Philippon lifting theorem for uh, formal power series of several variables that satisfy uh, some kind of Mahler equation, but in this more general setting. And the result here is just a byproduct of this more general theory. So uh, just to give you a rough, very rough idea of uh, what it is. So 
So Mahler's method in several variables, what you do is instead of looking the operator Z give to ZQ, uh, you replace this by uh, a monomial operator. So it means that you will replace Z1, ZN, and, and Z1 is replaced by some monomial in the Z1, ZN. So there is a matrix that um, uh, define uh, n, n by n matrix that define a tr such transformation. So for instance, if you choose this matrix here, T is one, two, three, four. So it will map Z, Z1 to Z1, Z2 square and Z2 to Z1 third, Z2 four. And then again, you can consider some linear systems associated related to this particular transformation and whose coefficients are so given by a matrix AZ and whose coefficients are uh, rational function in several variables. But when you try to prove, say, a uh, Nishoka theorem in this framework, so there are a number of new difficulties you have to overcome. Uh, during the, 19, uh, the late, maybe 1970s and uh, 1980s, uh, several mathematicians have tried to, to prove this Nishoka theorem in, in such context, and uh, including uh, uh, Kubota, uh, Nishoka, Loxton, and Van der Porten. Uh, there is also an, a very nice contribution by David Masser. And, uh, but people were a bit stuck, uh, and in the end, they were only able to, to deal with system like this, but essentially when the matrix AZ is a diagonal matrix. Um, and then uh, Nishoka uh, introduced uh, uh, new tools uh, that was introduced by Nesterenko and, um, and Philippon uh, in the setting of uh, transcendental number theory at that time. Uh, to prove in the case of one variable is theorem, or theorem, so the initial case theorem. But this, uh, these new tools do not apply well in the multivariate setting. And uh, what we did with, uh, with Colin Favagon is that we introduced uh, a number of new ing ingredients to be able to deal with general matrices, in particular, a new application of the Hilbert Null scale and that. Um, so it would be interesting to, to, to say more on the, the way we can prove such results, but instead uh, I would like to, to move to application and try to see, uh, to give some motivation to prove uh, our main theorem. So I recall you the, the main theorem. And uh, for me, there are two uh, main interests for that. So uh, the first motivation really comes from uh, transcendental number theory. So it usually it's so hard to prove that some numbers are transcendental or algebraically independent that it's always good to have a framework where we are able to prove uh, such general results. So that's the first point. And the second point is that um, uh, when we start this with, uh, with Colin Favergeon, we already had some application in mind. And uh, I'm going to, to describe you this, uh, this application. And I would like to publicize a bit on this uh, on this Mahler equation because um, people are usually much more interested by uh, E functions because they are solution of linear differential equations. They appear um, quite naturally in physics and many branch of mathematics. Uh, but these uh, uh, Mahler equations they have also their own interest even if it's a bit different and they are more related to expansion of number in some integer basis. And this is what I'm going to, to, to explain now. So um, we can go to this uh, second part of the talk and that is related to this uh, Furstenberg conjectures and finite automata. So the starting point here is a very vague heuristic uh, that says that uh, when you expand natural or real numbers in a multiplicatively independent basis, uh, such, as, such as two and three or two and 10, that should have no common structure. And the other comment is that it seems very, very difficult to confirm this heuristic uh, principle in some way or another, okay? So this is a place where we have a lot of conjecture. We can formulate many problems, but uh, it's, they are usually really hard to solve. Uh, and of course, this heuristic now is very vague and we have to formalize it a little bit. And the, the very first step is to try to find out some good problems related to this heuristic. To give you just an idea of what I mean by this, uh, you can consider the following uh, binary number. Uh, this is a two-month number 
And it's a number that is uh, defined by its uh, binary expansion. It's a real number. And uh, you just define the nth digit of this number uh, in the following way. So you write n in base uh, two, and you count the number of ones in, in this uh, binary expansion of n. And if the number of one is even, then the digits, the nth digit is zero. And if the number of one is one, uh, is odd, then uh, the nth digit will be one. Okay. So like this, you you define this uh, this two most number, and the point is that it has a very predictable expansion. So I guess that if I give you say a hundred of the first hundred digits, and if you start thinking a bit, you will find out a way to produce the other digits. So you you will be able to complete the expansion. But now. If you consider the same numbers and uh, move it to base 10 and look at its base 10 expansion. So I guess that even if I give you a billion uh, digits to look at, uh, you will have, uh, uh, you will be in trouble to find out some rules to describe this, those digits. So everything seems to be uh, just has to be break. Um, and we would like to, to have explanation for this, uh, this phenomenon. So at the end of the 1960s, uh, Furstenberg provided uh, a series of uh, conjectures that became uh, quite famous. And uh, I'm going now to, and they take place in the dynamical setting. So I'm going now to uh, give one of them, which is uh, my favorite one. Uh, so the dynamical setting is the following one. So you consider a very simple map but uh, that leads to some uh, tricky dynamics. Uh, so you consider the multiplication by Q on the circle. And we are going to consider the orbit of a point under this map. Here there is a well-known dictionary uh, between the dynamical properties, so uh, of the orbit of X, and the combinatorial properties of the base Q expansion of X. So X, uh, Q here, is a natural number at x equal to two. And uh, so the, the combinatorial properties of the expansion of x in base q are encoded in, into this orbit. So for instance, um, the orbit is finite if and only if um, the expansion of x in base q is eventually periodic, and in which case x is a rational number. We have also that the, the orbit is dense if and only if uh, every block of digits uh, occur infinitely often in the expansion of X. And the orbit is uniformly distributed with respect to the Lebesgue measure, if and only if uh, X is a normal number in base Q. So every block of digits occur with uniform frequency. So we have the, this very nice uh, dictionary. And the idea is that um, if the orbit is, is small in some sense, so the, the expansion of X in base Q is quite simple. And if the orbit is large, uh, the expansion of X in base Q is quite complicated. So then Fürstenberg suggested the, the following conjecture. So you choose two multiplicatively independent bases P and Q and a real number that is assumed to be irrational. The conjecture says that in that case, if you consider the closure uh, of the, or the two orbits, so under Tp and Tq of x, and take the house of dimensions, and the sum of the two house of dimension is at least equal to one. Okay. Um, it's worth mentioning that uh, the two assumptions, so the fact that the bases are multiplicatively independent and the fact that x is irrational are really needed. So you really need uh, this assumption, otherwise the conjecture is, is false. And uh, for instance, if X is rational number, then the, the orbit are finite. So the, the sum of the two of dimension is just zero. And uh, so you see if the, if the first orbit, so imagine the first orbit is small, so the house of dimension is small, then the, the conjecture says that the house of dimension in the other base has to be large. So the, the um, X has to have a quite complex expansion in base Q. So this conjecture, uh, beautifully expressed and in a very compact way is the fact that if, it, if a number X has a low complexity in one base and if it is irrational, it should have a high complexity 
in every other independent basis. Okay. Um, now let's see what can be said on this uh, conjecture. So the first thing is that uh, it is true uh, for almost every X with respect to Lebesgue measure. Uh, and this is a consequence of the uh, Birkhoff ergodic theorem, because uh, if you choose uh, the map TQ and dot with uh, the Lebesgue measure, so you get a, an ergodic dynamical system. So almost every orbit are uniformly distributed. And in that case, the orbit is dense. And so the house of dimension is just one. Uh, and it's the same almost surely in the, in the other base. So the sum of the two house of dimension is at least is equal to two uh, almost surely. OK. And in fact, the, the most interesting part of this conjecture is uh, when x has a simple expansion, and especially when x has zero entropy, so when the orbit of x has a zero topological entropy. And there is a very nice way to see this. Um, zero entropy in base q, uh, it just means that if you count the number of block of digits of size n you see in the expansion of x in base q, you know that this number is at most q to the n. But if it's less than an exponential, if it's sub-exponential with respect to n, then you obtain zero entropy. And zero entropy is equivalent to as of dimension zero for the closure of the orbit. So you see now that uh, if in the first base, say p, so the, the house of dimension is zero, then the conjecture predicts that in the other base, the house of dimension is exactly one. And in that case, we know that the orbit has to be dense. But if the orbit is dense, this means that in the other base, all block of digit has to occur. So in the other base, you have full entropy. Okay, and this is uh, really where the, the, the conjecture is stronger. So if you come back to the binary tumors number, what you get is that it's not hard to prove and it's well known that it has zero entropy in base two. As I told you, it, it has a very simple expansion in base two. So when you move to base 10, so the conjecture predicts that it should have full entropy. So every block of digit has to occur infinitely often. And this should expand, is, this would provide a very nice explanation for the phenomenon I, I mentioned before. Okay. Uh, Boris, um, we have a question in the chat room by Vincent Delacroix. Maybe, Vincent, maybe just uh, unmute and ask away. Uh, sure, if the microphone works. Do you hear me correctly? Yes. Uh, ah, yeah, very good. Uh, hi, hi, Boris. So the question is whether uh, in this conjecture there are examples of X where both quantities are neither zero nor one it's OPX, but the, the house of dimension is intermediate for both bases. Oh, for both bases, uh, I think that there are, um, there are some works of, of uh, Jan Bujo, I think, uh, but I don't have this in my mind right now. I, I would say yes, not, not probably not explicit example, but existence of numbers uh, with intermediate uh, house of dimension, but uh, I would have to check to be sure. Okay, okay thanks. But, but no, no explicit example for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, should I go back? From, okay, go on. Uh, so the, uh, recently, so we have this uh, very wonderful conjecture of Fustenberg, and recently, uh, and independently, Pablo Schmerkin and Meng Wu, uh, they prove uh, quite remarkable results in this direction. So uh, they prove that the set of exceptions to Fustenberg conjecture has out of dimension zero. So it's a little, very nice result because, as I told you, um, we already knew that uh, set of exception as measure zero. So it's a small set. And now we know that it's even smaller than this. It has house of dimension zero. So it's a little bit uh, situation similar to the Littlewood conjecture in diophantine approximation. And, um, but nevertheless, so uh, this theorem is, is quite remarkable, but um, Fustenberg conjecture remains uh, far out of reach of the current method. So you, you can think at first glance that uh, we already we are almost proving 
with this making who's around the conjecture, but this is not at all the case. And even worse than this, so uh, the most interesting part of Fürstenberg conjecture ex ex um, escaped to this, uh, to this theorem. So there is a result by uh, Modui and Morera uh, proving that if you consider the collection of all numbers with zero entropy in some basis, in some base, so all these numbers, they form a set of house of dimension zero. So all the number like the, the two most numbers, uh, they could all be in the set of exception. So this, the theorem say nothing about uh, these particular numbers. And this is the reason why uh, we are interested in finding um, problems that uh, uh, share the same heuristic, but maybe are more tractable than this uh, Furstenberg conjecture. Uh, and the, in our work with Colin Fabergeon, what we did is we moved to, from the dynamical setting to a computational point of view. So in that case, uh, you are interested in the so-called computable numbers. And they are the numbers that whose expansion in some ways can be computed by a general Turing machine. Most of the number you, you are interested in in arithmetic are computable, but uh, among computable numbers, some are easier to compute than other. And this allowed to find a kind of hierarchy between uh, computable numbers and to define some that are uh, especially simple. Uh, and the notion of simple number we are going to, to consider is a notion of automatic real numbers. So while uh, computable numbers can be generated by general Turing machines, so automatic numbers have expansions that can be generated by just a finite automaton that can be seen as a very rudimentary Turing machine. And that's why they are considering as simple numbers or numbers of low complexity. Uh, more precisely, we say that a real number X is automatic in base B uh, if there exists a finite automaton that takes as input uh, the expansion of N and produce as output the nth digit of X in the base B. I don't want to give a formal definition, but if we come back to the binary two most number, I already mentioned several times. So it's an example of an automatic number in base two. So which means that the sequence of digits here can be produced by a finite automaton. In this particular case, we only have an automaton with two states, A and B. And one of these states, the state A is the initial state. That's why we have this O here. And such machine has the ability to read a finite string of zero and one. And so the, the machine will work as follows. You start with n, the natural number n. You write n in base two. And like this, you get a finite string of zero and ones. And the machine is going to read this string, starting from left to right, digit by digit. So the reading of uh, the number n will correspond to a finite uh, pass in the graph. Now, if you end the reading in state b, the machine will output a one. And if you end the reading of the natural number n in, in state A, the machine will output a zero. And we can prove that this machine exactly computes the binary two most number. So in the general case, of course, an automatic numbers can be produced by uh, such a graph, but with an arbitrary number of states. So it, must be, it can be much, much more complicated. And, uh, but in these particular examples, we only have these two, two states. So once we have this notion of simple numbers, there is a very natural conjecture. Um, it's exactly as with Furstenberg conjecture, we start with two multiplicatively independent bases, P and Q, and one irrational number X. And the natural conjecture is that if X is simple in base P, it cannot be simple in base Q. So in our case, it means that if X is automatic in base P, it cannot be produced by an automaton in a base Q. Okay, and in fact, this conjecture is a very special instance of Furstenberg's conjecture because it's known that when X is automatic in base P, uh, the entropy of X in base P is zero. So Furstenberg conjecture predicts that the entropy of X in base Q is uh, full, is, uh, is one. And uh, in that case, uh, it cannot be automatic anymore. Okay. so. This is a very special instance of Furstenberg conjecture, but on the other way, um, this was completely open. So for instance, 
uh, a special case of this conjecture was conjectured uh, almost 20 years ago by Alush and Chalit in the well-known book on uh, automatic sequences. And um, uh, in fact, not a single number, real number, was known to be automatic in some bays and proved not to be not automatic in another bays. So even if you choose the specific example of the Chumos number, which is one of the most basic examples, uh, it's automatic in base two, and it was not known whether it, it is not automatic in base 10 or not automatic in base three. Okay. Uh, now, because I'm interested in transcendental number and algebraic independence, we, we can provide a stronger conjecture saying that uh, the situation is we have two multiplicatively independent bases, but now we pick two numbers, x1 and x2. Uh, each is automatic with respect to uh, a given base, and they are both irrational. So conjecture one predicts that they cannot be equal. x1 is not equal to x2. And what we expect is that, in fact, uh, x1 and x2 are algebraically independent. Uh, so, of course, conjecture two implies conjecture one. And um, conjecture two say, for instance, that if you start with a Chumos number and uh, you can take any uh, polynomial with algebraic coefficients in the Chumos numbers and then taking m's roots, uh, you will never end with something that is automatic in base 10. Okay. And you can even go one step further by saying you, you can choose x1, xr, uh, some irrational automatic numbers with respect to multiplicatively independent bases V1, Vr. And then again, you conclusion, the expected conclusion is that X1, Xr are algebraically independent. Uh, and of course, in the case R equal two, you, you get you obtain conjecture two. So we have three conjecture and conjecture three implies conjecture two that implies conjecture one. Okay. So now what is the connection with the uh, Mahler's method and the first part of the talk? So it comes here. It was noticed uh, already in 1968 by Coban, but there is a fundamental connection between this finite automata and so with automatic numbers and M function. So the point is that if X is an automatic number in base B, so you have this sequence of digits A0, A1, A2 that is produced by a finite automaton, then the generating series here, F of Z, uh, satisfy a Mahler equation. So it's an M function. So in particular, so not that the, the, the AI here are just uh, between zero in the set zero, one up to B minus one. So there are the, just the digits. So there exists uh, an M function F of Z whose coefficients are rational. And uh, that is it. when evaluated at the point one over B, which is the rational point, give my automatic number X, okay? So if you remember the, the dichotomy we had, so we already know that such number, because the equations are rational and the point is rational, so these automatic numbers are either rational or transcendental. So, and in particular, this means that if you consider an irrational algebraic number like square root of two, its expansion in base 10 cannot be produced by a finite automaton. Okay, so uh, this, this question was, this was a conjecture for a while and uh, the fact that the square root of two uh, is not generated by a finite automaton uh, was first proved uh, in a joint work with uh, Jan Bujo uh, using the Schmidt subspace theorem. And uh, here we, we obtain a new proof using this Mahler's method. And each approach has its own advantage. And uh, so the Mahler's the, the subspace theorem approach is much more flexible somehow, but uh, it works hardly with several numbers, while Mahler's method is well suitable to prove algebraic independence of numbers. Uh, but once you have this connection, what you can say is that um, all problems concerning algebraic relation between automatic numbers, uh, they can be restated and even extended as problems concerning algebraic relation between values of M function at algebraic points. And I have to say here that um, uh, when X is automatic, but gen generated by an automaton with a large number of states, then the M function you get uh, satisfy an equation with large order. So when you want to deal with general automata, you have to understand general M function. 
once we have this connection, so we, we are almost ready to, to, to prove um, the main problems I mentioned. So I would just want to finish the talk by, by showing you that. So if we come back to our main results uh, of the first part, so uh, the assumption was that we have some function f1, fr, which are power series and which are m functions. And then we have points, alpha one, alpha r, which are algebraic in the open unit disk and non-zero, uh, such that the fi are well-defined at, at alpha i. And then we consider the, the number field generated by all the coefficients and all the points. And the point i of the, the, the first part of the main theorem was that if we assume that the alpha one, alpha r, the points are multiplicatively independent, then we can deduce that the values are algebraically independent unless one of them belongs to the number field k. So with this, you can easily deduce uh, the three conjecture. So solve the three conjecture I mentioned. So, and we are just going to see how to prove the conjecture three, which I remember you in place conjecture two and conjecture one. So you start with x1, xr, some irrational automatic numbers with respect to some multiplicatively independent basis b1, br. That's the setting of conjecture three. So we have several automatic numbers in different bases, but the bases are independent. By the connection provided by Cobham, we know that Xi is automatic in base Bi, so which means that there exists some M function Fi with rational coefficients so that Xi is just Fi at the point one over Bi. So you set alpha i to be one over Bi, and you see that the function, the equation are rational and the point is rational. So we can have K is just Q. So now because the BI are assumed to be multiplicatively independent, their inverse are also multiplicatively independent. So the, the number alpha I, the numbers alpha one, alpha R are multiplicatively independent. And the number are assumed to be irrational. So none of them belong to the number field K because K is just Q. So the conclusion is that uh, our number x1, xr are algebraically independent. And this was precisely what conjecture three uh, was saying. Okay, so this proof conjecture three and just conjecture two and just conjecture one. Uh, so that's a right place to, to, to stop. I just would like to add one small thing is that the, in the main theorem there are two points. So there are also point two and point two are specific uh, uh, application uh, in particular to expansion not of real numbers in independent basis, but to natural numbers in independent basis. For instance, if you look at the uh, power of two, the sequence of power of two in base two, they have a very nice expansion, a one followed by a bunch of zero. But if you move to base 10, it's much harder to recognize uh, if a number is a power of two in base 10, and uh, you can use the point two of uh, our main theorem to, to, to have results in this direction. Okay, so thank you very much for, for your attention. <laughs>